This is Dr. Ana Maria Gonzalez from our Spanish department. Well, uh, first of all, uh, considering the food crisis that we're facing, it's really amazing what you are doing. And, and it's certainly um, uh, praising, you know, the work that you're doing at a restaurant level. But I think that we're facing a, even a bigger challenge when we consider the cafeterias at school and, and the number of people that are daily fed you know, at the system of the cafeterias. And just two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go to one of the major state universities, and I'm talking about UT Austin, and somehow it was depressing for me to see, you know, certainly for the students, it's like, oh, there's the biggest joy that they can have when they have Taco Bell and Wendy's and McDonald's, you know, as part of the, as, as part of the feeding system that they have at the university. And for me, you know, probably as professor uh, or as I'm going through the process of learning what we have in front of us was rather depressing. And I would like to ask you, what is going to take, you know, what do you think is going to take for the students, for the entire population really to realize what we're facing? And when I think about also the cafeteria system, the children are the main target of all these trash products, you know, that we have in TV, that we have in uh, supermarkets. How do we stop that? I know it's a big question, but I would like to hear what you have to say. Thank it, you. Well, it's, it's interesting because how many retirement plans are invested in these corporations that are targeting the children as well? And so they also give a good return. And so I think when we, we need to really prioritize in our country what's important to us and how do we sustain these small cultures that, we're, that are eroding at such a fast pace because of what you're talking about, this whitewashing, this mass-produced um, food. Um, but it, it's, it goes beyond food. It goes, beyond the, it goes to the heart of the family, sitting down at the dinner table, people actually cooking. And, we're, and I've profited from cooking as a spectator sport on TV. And part of me is ashamed of that because now we just watch that. We watch the competitions, and food is a competition, while we eat something that we have no relationship to. And so I'm also trying to get out there now and preach the message that it's, it's the home cook that's going to change it. And it's we, the people, that decide that we won't buy that garbage. And maybe we eat that garbage on occasion. But... The companies will follow, they'll change their programs as we change. But I don't see families just sitting down at the table together. I don't see, I, I'm on my soapbox every day. I want my children to learn how to use the utensils. <laughs> Everything now is made from a stick or to shove, da, 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 and I love it. And I love it. Who doesn't love it? You love to eat the hamburger, but there's also with every step we take further and further away from that dinner table, um, we're, we're eroding even faster than you think. And I, I don't think that it's a matter of bad people because I think all of us are the people that are investing in these companies, the 401k plans that are, have some stock and you know, it's just like everybody hating the oil companies, but we've also depended upon them. And, it's supply and demand. And if we start demanding, if we demand something of ourselves and we change the way that we, that we purchase vegetables, then before you know it, somebody will be there to provide for us what it is that we're demanding. I hope that answered a little something. Um, so I have a question kind of about seasonal food and a lot of people in our generation, we don't realize that certain foods, vegetables, meats happen or um, are only available at different times in the years. And so I was wondering how that affects your restaurants and does that affect your customers or do you, do you have seasonal menus? And also how we can educate the the new um, this generation that there are seasonal foods and that. Um, it really depends on lo like where you are and you know what time of the year it is for what you're eating and that it's not it shouldn't be just regular or like available at all the times well that's a message that I try to preach on a regular basis and I preach it try to I try to preach it one through my actions and 
I wrote a cookbook. My cookbook is called My New Orleans because that's where I'm from. And it's my version of what I grew up with. You know, my, it's New Orleans through my eyes. Broken down into different seasons. You have crawfish season, followed by strawberry season, followed by this, followed by that, all the way around through the shrimp come in the season in the early summer. And, and if we can program ourselves to eat what is available, what's available locally, then you're automatically, you're automatically doing that. If you can eat local, then your mind is made up for you. And that's why people used to can things because things aren't available throughout the year. And so tomato season, you have an abundance of tomatoes. So you can the tomatoes so that you would have it for the times of the year when you're cooking and there are no fresh tomatoes. And it's just getting back and uh, you, you think that you've lost it, but you're really, your generation really hasn't lost it. Your generation is going to be the generation that really brings us back to where we need to be. And I have complete faith in that. And I'm sure there's probably some faculty rolling their eyes. But the truth is, is that your generation is a generation that's starting to demand. You know when, uh, I think, um, I want to say Michael Pollan said it best in Omnivore's Dilemma. I could be wrong. That you know we're making a difference when Walmart has an organic section. And that that is not the answer. But we're headed, at least somebody there is thinking, wow, we can make money on this. And what I want to do is just break it down to that level of community, supporting community, supporting community. And what happens there is something much greater than just our health. It's, it's, the, um, it's the sustainability of cultures. And I'm ashamed to say that there, you know, now in my kitchens I have more white boys from the suburbs cooking than I do the people from New Orleans. And then and we're bringing in people from California who have never really eaten good food before. I'm not saying they don't have good food out there. <laughs> but we're bringing people in and I'm trying to give them like, this is what you know an etouffee is, this is what a gumbo is, this is, and if we're not careful, we're gonna, all this stuff will be eroded because of the food ways changing, but it's also because they're supplying this demand of just quick, convenient eating. We're going to take another question from uh, Vice President Steve Anderson, and then I had a quick question before we, we need to leave and swipe your cards, but let's listen to Mr. Anderson, please. Um, how trustworthy do you think uh, restaurant menu descriptions of the source of food is? Uh, Gulf shrimp? grass-fed beef, and do you think there are adequate uh, regulations or other in enforcement mechanisms to, to uh, guarantee that what, you know, what the description is on the menu is in fact what it is? I don't know. I think we could, to what end do we regulate? And that's kind of, that gets into a whole other issue. Um, you have some restaurants that are very good at it and some that are very bad. And I think we, the people, hold their feet to the fire, we can then dictate that, hey, you, you've got to police yourself much better than what you're doing. I, the whole word regulation kind of scares me too because who are the regulators? What have they regulated for so far? Our water, look at our water supply. Look at the food supply that they've so-called regulated. Look at how the chickens are raised. Look at the eggs that we eat. The food that they've regulated so far is absolute garbage. And so I don't trust the regulators, but I trust the fact that we need to get passionate about what we eat and what we feed our children. And when we start doing that on a very grassroots level, then we will see the bigger changes that you're talking about because they will have to change in order to supply that demand. One more quick question. Uh, Thanks. When you were talking about opening up your restaurant in San Antonio, I, and you mentioned several of the areas that most of the produce and meat's going to come from, I realized that a lot of it is from the San Antonio area, but it's not from San Antonio. So I was curious about some of the problems uh, that arise with the transportation of fresh produce and fresh meats, and whether or not you can marry this ideology in, area, in metropolitan areas like New York and Washington, D.C., that don't have the infrastructure of horticulture or agriculture to support this type of idea that you have. 
but New York most certainly has it. Upstate New York is some of the richest farmland ever, but the farmland has just been turned into subdivision after subdivision, and kind of you, you, you have to go further out. Connecticut is where most of the farm, farmland from the green market and Western Mass that comes to Union Square on a, on a daily basis. And if you look at what they can do in New York, you would think, why have we lost these beautiful farmer's markets and the traditions of the farmer's markets that date back how long to San, in San Antonio? I mean, a long time. But what's happened to those farmers? The farmers left, and the agriculture left, because I can buy it any time of the year from right here in, my, you know, in my, this grocery store, and they'll continue to supply it to me because I continue buying it. And what's produced from who knows where on some mass farm with fertilized with who knows, knows what is 10 times cheaper or at least five times cheaper than what the farmer can actually grow it for. So I say support that farmer and all that starts to come back. And go to the farmer's market. And you see, you're talking about this, the, your generation out there today, you're the ones that are shopping at the farmer's markets again. It's not my mama. It, frankly, and I'm not, <laughs> forgive me, mom. But, <laughs> We have got to get out, you know, there's a price to pay for convenience. And we've seen what that's doing to our, to our economy in certain areas. You see what it's doing to our culture, and we see what it's doing to the earth. And I think if we can start to support that, then there will be more of that. I think you will have problems in some places like Bismarck, North Dakota or whatever. They're, they're, and that's why not a whole lot of people live up there. But, you have areas like where I come from, where you come from, that we can grow things 11 months out of the year. Heck, something grows 12 months out of the year. <laughs> and then you eat with the seasons, and you support those that actually toil in the act of farming. And consequently, if people see that there's some money to be made by farming, they will start to farm again. And you do see, I'm seeing in our area, I'm working with our Department of Agriculture that, uh, for the state of Louisiana, where we have small groups of you know, small farming communities coming up in places that haven't seen agriculture for, for the past 50 years. And so I think it's promising, but only if we keep focused on the source of our food. Thank you. Thank you. Now, students today, I have one last question, and then I, would, I just found out, too, that you can swipe your card, stay through the whole thing, swipe your card at 1130 and still get credit, so we can go on for a minute more. Students are interested in getting a job, and I don't know if a lot of them know that we have a new Culinary Institute of America, CIA school, at the Pearl Brewery just down the road, from, just down the river from Luke, mm -hmm. and the biggest farmer's market is right there, too. We have a Cordon Bleu in Austin, also a fabulous place, and it doesn't take that long to get that degree. Would you encourage our students here to go for that if they really are interested in food? I encourage, I think one of the blessings that I had as a, as a young man growing up in, with my family, my father had us pursue our passions, and if this is what you're passionate in, by all means do it. It's hard work, it's blue collar work, it's not pretty, but if you enjoy doing it, it's the most rewarding thing on earth. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to support my family doing what it is that I absolutely love. And I feel like in a lot of ways that, and I don't mean to be too preachy up here, but in a lot of ways that um, if, if you pursue your passions and use those gifts that God has given you and you bring it all together, doing what you enjoy doing, you'll never work a day in your life. 